Welcome to our first video on daylighting, focusing on the subject of understanding sun angles. Light and heat from the sun has the potential to illuminate our environment, elevate our mood, keep us warm, and improve our health. These are all really positive effects. It also has the potential to overheat us and oppress us when we're already too warm and to cause visual discomfort if it's too intense or coming from the wrong direction for the purposes of viewing our task. The direction of beam sunlight is constantly changing over the course of the day and the year. Understanding sun angles is crucial to configuring our buildings so that they will be better illuminated, more cheerful, warmer in winter, cooler in summer, and generally more energy efficient. So the question is, how do we go about trying to understand sun angles? This actually turns out to be a very bewildering and complex subject. Uh, it took human beings a very long time to evolve an understanding of it. And even for modern students, it tends to be fairly challenging. And one of the reasons for that is that in our day-to-day -day experience, we don't see a lot of the fundamental geometry associated with sun angles. And uh, it's a bit like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle from which about half of the pieces have been removed. And missing those pieces makes it essentially impossible to put together the rest of the puzzle. So what we would like to do is take an approach on all of this where we try to zoom outside of our worldview and take a more celestial um, global view of things in order to understand what the entire puzzle is and then we'll better understand what it is we see of it as, as uh, inhabitants of this planet. So this uh, diagram shows the Sun as a tiny white dot floating in the heavens and at the scale that we're looking at this the earth's orbit uh, the earth would not even be visible it would be a speck of light that's so faint that we wouldn't be able to see it but to understand where it is we've shown it in its orbit around the sun and it actually moves in an elliptical orbit um, which is very close to a circle uh, in this particular view though we're looking um, at an angle to the uh, ecliptic plane or in other words the orbital plane of the earth is being viewed in an angle where the ellipse is much more eccentric than it would be if we were viewing perpendicular to the orbital plane and the orbit in this case has been drawn to scale relative to the Sun and from the Sun we've shown two rays of light coming to the earth from opposite sides of the Sun and you'll note here that those rays are not actually quite parallel uh, they in fact are diverging by about a half a degree and in spite of that fact for a very long period of time the closest thing that we ever had to parallel light was beam sunlight and in fact beam sunlight is so close to parallel that it produces very sharp shadows and generally speaking, if we want to get really dramatic and effective images of an architectural model, we want to take it out in the sunlight and photograph it there because we want these rays of light to be almost parallel. From the point of view of architectural considerations, we can treat them as if they are parallel. Uh, the fact that they're not parallel becomes problematical for people who do high concentration solar collectors because they're not able to treat the Sun as if it's actually a point source of light. But for architectural purposes, we can treat them as if they're essentially parallel rays of light. Now, um, in order to understand the experience of human beings on the planet Earth moving around in this orbit, we're going to redo this drawing we're going to keep the Sun the same size, we're going to keep the orbit the same size, but we're going to blow the Earth up. So this is what the Earth would look like in a sort of schematic kind of way. The Earth rotates on an axis, 
which is not perpendicular to its orbital plane. In fact, it's tilted at 23 and a half degrees relative to the normal, to the, to the uh, orbital plane. And in the summer solstice, which is June 21st, the axis of the Earth is tilted. The northern uh, portion of the Earth's axis is tilted more towards the sun than any time of any other time of year. Um, the North Pole is bathed in light the entire day. Um, and in fact, the sun just moves around at 23 and a half degrees above the horizon plane, which would be a rather disorienting place to be uh, because solar direction would be relatively meaningless there. Unless, of course, you had a really good watch in which case um, you could you could uh, know where east and west and north and south were based on just lining up your watch with the direction of the sun. Now, um, as the Earth moves around the sun, we arrive at something called an equinox, which is around September 21st. The uh, sun is actually, the rays of light from the sun are coming in parallel to the Earth's equatorial plane, or in other words, perpendicular to the Earth's axis of rotation, uh, in which case if you were standing at either the North Pole or the South Pole, you would have 24 hours of watching the sun skimming along the horizon plane. Uh, as we continue on around, uh, we get to December 21st, which is the winter solstice. At that point, the uh, North Pole is tilted at its maximum amount away from the sun's rays and the South Pole is bathed in light 24 hours a day and if you were at the South Pole you would see the sun moving around in the sky always at 23 and a half degrees above the horizon plane. As we continue on around March 21st we get to the second equinox where the sun's rays are coming in parallel to the Earth's equatorial plane or in other words perpendicular to this axis. So the Earth's movement in the orbit around the Sun and its rotation around the axis are what lead to the rather complex patterns of light that we observe. We'll take a couple of really simple cases though. Suppose we take June 21st and December 21st and, and we're going to blow them up even further um, and so on December 21st, the rays are coming in this direction. On June 21st, they're coming in that direction. And so when we look at it, it looks something like this. So this would be June 21st right here and December 21st here. On June 21st, the rays are going this way. You'll notice the North Pole bathed in light. If we have an observer somewhere around um, 35 and a half degrees or 36 degrees and that person stands out in the midday sun and points they see an angle of 77.5 degrees above the horizon plane. On the other hand at this time of year in December 21st where the Earth's North Pole is tilted away uh, that sun is coming in at 30 and a half degrees relative to the horizon plane. If this was the only kind of time of day and time of year that we had to worry about, solar design would be really easy because uh, we basically, at this latitude, orient most of our glazing facing south. We protect ourselves from the overhead sun, which would be problematical as this person's posture is indicated. The midday summer sun is generally almost overhead. So we want a really good opaque roof and we want uh, good southern glass to accept the winter heat. Unfortunately, of course, life is more complicated than that and the solar motion is a much more three-dimensional kind of thing. So we're going to try to figure out how we can understand that pattern over the course of a day. To do that, we're going to take two views of the Earth. One is a polar view where we're looking down on the North Pole, and the other is an equatorial view where we're in the equatorial plane of the Earth. And we're going to start on noon on June 21st, which is the summer solstice, 
which is the time when the North Pole is tilted the greatest towards the Sun. And we're going to create an observer, and we're going to give this uh, observer a set of needles which are going to be pointed towards the Sun. Uh, in this case, the needles have been drawn red, and just for reference, I'll go back to this diagram. This resembles something like a needle with about a half a degree of divergence. Now when we come here, we've got a needle again, except to keep it from visually disappearing, we had to sort of double its fatness. And of course, we've made the needle really much longer than any observer could wield, but we're kind of uh, exaggerating its size to show the general direction. So you see a shadow line right here, and the needle is coming in perpendicular to that, indicating that the sun is coming from that direction. Uh, and then this is what it looks like in the polar view. And so we can imagine that this person has these needles and a lump of stiff clay, and over the course of a day, uh, this observer is going to uh, plot out the direction of the sun. So the Earth, uh, every hour, rotates 1 24th of the way around, because there are 24 hours in the day. So the, the Earth rotates 360 degrees in a day, or 15 degrees in an hour, or in a half an hour, it's 7 and a half degrees. So this shows the view of the Earth a half an hour later. So the original needle that was put in has now rotated to this position, and the observer has put in a new needle indicating the new direction of the sun. So again, that's a seven and a half degree rotation in a half an hour period. Uh, a half an hour later again, the two previous needles have rotated another seven and a half degrees, and a new needle gets put in place. A half an hour later, the three previous needles have moved seven and a half degrees and another needle gets put in place. And this process continues on until this point in the day where sunset is taking place for the observer. So uh, a normal observer would have to go home and start this process again the next day. Uh, what we're going to do though is we're going to endow this observer or this experimentalist with the ability to look through the earth. And this comes back to the point I was making earlier that there's, the puzzle is actually not that complicated if you have all the pieces. What makes our lives complicated is the earth intervenes with in the, for, in the path of the sun and denies us a vision of all the other hours uh, during the nighttime. But we're going to endow this observer with a special gift to look through the earth so this observer is not going to go to bed but is going to just stand there all night long every half an hour putting one of these needles in place and by the end of the next day this is the pattern that we will see. There will be 48 of these needles, one for every half hour of the day and you'll notice some of these needles appear to be going through the earth, which is the case because the observer uh, is looking through the earth. So this is the pattern from the side. This is the pattern from the top. And when we describe the geometry that's being uh, created by these needles, it is a cone which is deviating from a flat plane by 23 and a half degrees. It has an axis of symmetry, which is parallel to the axis of rotation of the Earth. So in other words, it's in the nature of this problem that even though the surface of the Earth is moving as the Earth rotates and the Earth is moving through its orbit, these are relatively minor effects in terms of the observations that are made and in fact, the crucial thing that's generating this geometry is this rotation of the observer as the observer stands on the Earth and the Earth rotates. So we have this, we call this the summer solstice cone. It's opening upward or towards the direction of the, that the North Pole is pointing in, and it deviates from a flat plane by 23 and a half degrees.
Now, one month later, uh, in July, the sun has changed its position slightly, and this cone is now not so extreme, so it's slightly more than 20 degrees, um, but it's still very clearly a cone, and its axis of symmetry is still parallel to the axis of rotation of the Earth. One month later, it's slightly over 11 degrees, so things are moving a lot faster now. Uh, and again, the axis of symmetry is parallel to the axis of rotation of the Earth. So one month later, on October 21st, the cone is opening downward. And again, the axis of symmetry of the cone is parallel to the axis of rotation of the Earth. And this deviation from flatness is about is a little over 11 degrees. One month later, uh, in November 21st, the cone is opening downward again, but in a more dramatic way, with a deviation from flatness of slightly over 20 degrees. And then one month later, on December 21st, the cone is opening downward and is deviating from flatness by 23 and a half degrees. Now we can draw all of these cones that we've just been talking about on a single diagram. They don't all exist at once, but we can look at them as a sort of collection or set of surfaces. Now, the first thing, of course, is anyone who thinks about it for a while realizes that these cones don't actually close on themselves. What's actually happening is, over the course of a day, the Earth is moving in its orbit, and so it's sort of very, very gradually evolving uh, in, in a sort of spiraling pattern. It's creating uh, a large number of these almost cones. So for the purposes of what we're doing, We've treated them as if the cones close on themselves because we don't know how to draw 365 of these 48 needle sets that wouldn't just look like a mess diagrammatically. We've also done it this way because the failure of these cones to precisely close is not of any architectural significance. And in fact, we often don't even need seven of these cones uh, to represent this uh, from an architectural point of view. Uh, three or even two cones may suffice for making our arguments. Um, and in fact, what I'm going to do is just reduce it down to three cones right off the bat. So we're going to have a summer solstice cone, which is the red, an equinox cone, which is the yellow, and finally the winter solstice cone, which is the green. It turns out that these cones are absolutely identical no matter where you are on the Earth. That turns out to be an extraordinary simplification. Um, and, and the irony, of course, is that um, the, solar, the sun angles that we see vary dramatically from one part of the Earth to the other. So it's kind of shocking to make this discovery that these cones are actually the same everywhere. And the only difference is what portions of the cones you're seeing. So they're same at the equator and similarly at the North Pole. So we'd like to try to understand why those things can be so similar and yet the effects that we observe on the Earth are so dramatically different. And the way we're going to start that process is we're actually going to show the, the horizon plane for the Earth. So we're starting at zero latitude, which is at the equator. And as I extend out this plane to represent the horizon plane of the Earth, then we can begin to see what portion of the needles we see and what we don't. In this case, the horizon plane is seen ed edge on from above and edge on from the side. So we don't see a plane exactly. We just see a line that represents that plane. And one of the things you'll notice is that 
At the equator, there are exactly 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness during the summer. There are exactly 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness during the equinox, and likewise exactly 12 hours of light during the winter solstice and exactly 12 hours of darkness during the winter solstice. In other words, every day is 12 hours of sunlight. And the sun tends to be moving almost perpendicular to the horizon plane, so sunsets occur fairly quickly at the, at the equator. The other thing to notice is that the sun tends to be totally in the northern sky during the summertime, totally in the southern sky during the winter, and is straight overhead during the equinox. But anyway you cut it, the ideal architecture from a solar point of view uh, at the equator, especially if you're near sea level where things tend to always be overheated at the equator, you'd like architecture that's sort of tunnel-like. In other words, it blocks the overhead light and the east and west light, um, but not but lets in the light and the ventilation from the north and the south. Now, if we move further north to a 30 degree latitude, suddenly we see this horizon plane. We see it edge on here, and it's represented by a line in our equatorial view. But in the polar view, we're actually seeing this plane as we stare down at the Earth. And granted, of course, it's just a representation of what it feels like to a person standing on the Earth who perceives the Earth as flat because the Earth is so large. Uh, in order to make it visible, we've had to blow it up just like we blew the needles up. Now one of the things you'll notice is we have two extra needles in the morning during the summertime and two extra needles in the afternoon. Each needle represents a half an hour, so that means we have one extra hour in the morning and one extra hour in the evening during the summertime. So at this latitude, summer days are approximately 14 hours long. You'll notice at the equinox though, it's still a 12 hour, 12 hours of sun and 12 hours of darkness. Hence the term equinox, and that turns out to be true at every latitude that you, you get exactly 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of no sunlight at the equinox. During the winter time, you'll notice that we've lost a couple of needles here compared to what we had at the equator. So we've lost an hour of light in the morning and an hour of light in the evening. So days at this latitude are 10 hours long at the winter solstice, 14 hours at the summer solstice, 12 hours at the equinox, 10 hours at the winter solstice. So on average at this latitude, they still have 12 hours of light per day. It's just they have much longer days during the summertime than during the winter time and much different sun angles. So if we go to 45 degrees, we discover that we've picked up almost four extra needles in the morning and four in the afternoon. So in other words, we've added two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening at this latitude. So when we add that to our 12 hours, we've got a 16 hour day at the summer solstice. Likewise, we've lost that many needles here. So in fact, we have an eight hour day um, during the winter solstice. Again, it all averages out to 12 hours of light per day, but we have 16 hour summer days and eight hour winter days. And you'll also notice these low angles which means that uh, the sun tends to not be terribly bright during the winter time. And if in addition to that, you have climate conditions that make it cloudier during the winter time, which is very common, then this can be a fairly depressing climate to be in. Uh, we can go even further north. This is 60 degree of the latitude where we have really long summer days and really short winter days. 
when we get to the Arctic Circle, which is 67 and a half degrees latitude, we see that the horizon plane is tangent to the cones, tangent to the summer cone, tangent to the winter cone. What this means is that during the summertime, the sun never sets. It's fairly high in the southern sky at midday and it sweeps through the western sky and skims along the northern horizon and then rises again. And this is why this is called the land of the midnight sun because during the summertime they have 24 hours of sunlight. The sad part of this is that during the wintertime they get just a little bit of beam sunlight as the sun, half of the sun will be visible above the horizon plane at midday during winter time it comes up just barely and then disappears again if we went all the way to the north pole uh, we literally will have six months of light during the midsummer or summer solstice it's 23 and a half degrees above the horizon plane and it just moves around uh, at, at a steady 23 and a half degrees altitude it slowly spirals down and three months later there's an equinox where the sun is just skimming along the horizon plane and then there's six months of darkness after that. We can represent this in a three-dimensional sculpture also. Uh, in this case the axis of symmetry of the cones is this element. This rod represents east and west um, this is the summer cone, this represents the winter cone, and this would be the equinox. In this case, the bars here, instead of representing half hours like our needles did, these bars represent one hour. So this is 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., and so forth, represented by these elements. We can put this into a liquid. In this case, it's water with little bits of styrofoam floating on it to create the visual effect of the ground plane. This would be at the equator. This is directly east, directly west. This is south, that's north. This is the summer cone and the winter cone, or the winter solstice cone. And here is the equinox. So, um, at the equinox, the sun rises directly east. It rises in a vertical plane overhead and sets directly west. At the summer solstice, it rises 23 and a half degrees north of east. It stays in the northern sky, always deviating from this vertical plane by 23 and a half degrees. During the winter time, it rises 23 and a half degrees south of east, and it stays in the, su in the southern sky, always deviating by 23 and a half degrees from the vertical plane that's represented by this equinox curve. So keep in mind that 23 and a half degrees, um, though the sun rises generally in the eastern sky and sets generally in the western sky, but only sets east and west at, arises in the east exactly and sets in the west exactly during the equinox. So if we go to a further northern climate, in this case it's 30 degrees north latitude, now what you'll notice is we've lost an hour because that bar has disappeared and the sun isn't rising until 7 p.m. solar time. On the other hand, during the summertime it rises at 5 a.m solar time. So it rises at 7 a.m. during the winter time, 5 a.m. during the summer time. We get an extra hour here. We lose an hour there. Again, the equinox doesn't change because it's a plane and as that plane rotates about this axis, it doesn't change its relationship to the horizon plane. One really key difference is that as this thing rotates downward, what was a 23 and a half degree angle is now increasing. And in this latitude, it's close to 30 degrees. 
that the sun rises south of east during wintertime and roughly 30 degrees that it rises north of east during the summertime. And among Neolithic people, they used to carry little symbols with them that depicted that angle. And that turned out to be a very important communication tool to let other people understand what latitude they came from. It's not clear they understood exactly what latitude was, but they understood that many weather effects correlated very strongly with that solar angle. <clears throat> and as a consequence, it, it was a very meaningful communication tool relative to telling other people what kind of climate you came from. Okay, so this is 45 degrees. Again, we've lost two hours during the, the, the morning and two hours in the evening during the winter solstice. So we have 12 hours minus four, which is eight hours. And then during the summertime, we've gained two extra hours. So we have a 16 hour summer day. This is what it looks like at the Arctic Circle. Again, we mentioned that at the winter solstice, the sun just barely skims above the horizon towards the south and then sets immediately. During the summertime, the sun whirls around, sweeping through the sky, skimming down along the northern horizon, and then rising up fairly high in the southern sky. And then this is what it looks like at the North Pole where the sun just skims around 23 and a half degrees above the horizon plane during the summer equinox. I want you to note that in this particular example, we have drawn these hour bars as if they are simple bars. Um, so in other words, this bar gets rotated 15 degrees about the symmetry axis to produce that bar, which can then be rotated to produce that bar and so forth. This is a somewhat simplified view because it turns out that the Earth is not in a precise circular orbit. It's in a slightly uh, eccentric uh, elliptical orbit. And that means Sometimes of the year, the, the gravity is slowing the Earth down, and sometimes the gravity of the Sun is speeding the Earth up slightly as it sort of falls along the eccentric uh, ellipse. And as a consequence, solar time actually is not as precise, not nearly as precise as something like a cesium clock or a uh, such as they have at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And that cesium clock, by the way, is what keeps your cell phones and things like that very precisely uh, timed. So in fact, if you go out by your cell phone and take a photograph at a certain hour of the day, every day, uh, or say once a week for a year, you can get something that looks like this. And um, so this is a photograph of the sun and every one of these intervals is a seven day interval. And you'll notice that the sun is passing this elliptical path. So instead of what we just saw where we represented it by a simple bar, there would be that strange figure eight pattern here. And then that would be occurring then again there. So it's, uh, our, our representation of these hour uh, bars on our geometric construct are not exactly precise. And you will begin to see effects like this when you take some of the computer programs that, uh, sim that uh, simulate sun angles. And you'll pick a very specific latitude and lo location, and it will account for uh, all of these effects, these subtle effects having to do with the shape of the Earth's orbit. So it can be a little confusing because you may start off with a very simple concept of what the solar geometry is and you get some of these odd effects associated with this. From an energy point of view, it turns out not to be significant at all that these little lags are occurring. Um, 
but it does mean that you have to be alert when you do a simulation to understand what these effects are. When we go to do experimental simulations of these things, um, we typically represent this, the uh, solar motion with a straight bar here, or in this case it's slightly curved to direct the light where we want it to go, but it is not that odd figure eight that we're accounting for because it's more than accurate enough to just use the straight bar. In this particular simulator, uh, the sun can be located here, the light source, which would be the equinox. It can be located up here, which would represent the summer solstice, or down here it could represent the winter solstice. In this case, the model has been moved up to the center of geometry of this ring, and the ring represents the movement of the sun over the course of the day. So our tracking occurs along here. Um, time of year occurs along this bar and then latitude effects are accounted for by this ring actually rotating about a pivot point here. So there are three key variables in the geometry of this. There's the rotation to achieve latitude which is done by rotating the ring. There's the movement of the light source along this bar which represents the time of year and then the bar moves around the ring to represent hours of the day. That concludes our video, our initial video related to daylighting, which is titled Understanding Sun Angles.